you have a verse there, but I want to start with chapter 3 and verse 11. It says that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. That's evident. For the just shall live by faith. And I, 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 I uh, wanted to build on that just, just a little bit and give you a couple more scriptures. And it has to do with, it's, it's everyday life, and it's, it's whether or not, it, it, you know, Terry's a great example. We mentioned that already, and uh, Paul's a great example. We mentioned that also, that you live by faith. Faith is a way of life, and also faith, and of course, faith in what? You, you can have faith in all kinds of things. We're specifically talking about faith in the Word of God. We're talking about faith in God's faithfulness. Yes, faith in God's character, faith in His in the Spirit. And that's what causes a supernatural reaction to death. The world doesn't act like this when somebody close to them dies. There's, 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 there's loss of hope. There's a shattered lives. There's a, a, a grief that comes over them. And grief is a, is a spirit. I've experienced grief. I've been... Th- I, I, we, me personally, the worst part that I can remember uh, it was a six-month period where I buried three very close family members, my mother, my sister, and a nephew, which was 29 years old and had a little one on the way with his wife. And, you know. So grief can come, and, but grief is not of God. Grief is a wicked spirit. It's of Satan. And it does come, yet there's loss, but loss doesn't necessarily have to be coupled with grief. Grief is a debilitating, nasty thing, and that's why I say it's of, it's of Satan. It comes over you like a wave, and you just, you just fall apart. And uh, y- there's pushback. You need to realize that's not from God, that I have a hope, and that I don't have to be under this heavy blanket of anything. So... Uh, the nice thing is, is that when you realize that, well, I was a little deceived at the at the at the time, where I thought, well, this is just a natural part of, you know, losing somebody, and natural is the is the key word there, and the nice thing is, is that we've been learning about living in the supernatural, living above the natural. You don't have to just give yourself over to the natural things that just occur. So, the pushback on our part is that we live by faith. And it's faith in the Word of God. It's faith in the Spirit of God. It's faith in everything that God's provided for us. Uh, if you remember, now I'm not, you know, this is going to be a totally different thing than what I had planned. If you remember in Isaiah 53, I've got to find that. Isaiah 53, it says, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For Jesus, it doesn't say Jesus, for he, I'm uncertain Jesus, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely, absolutely, positively, without a doubt, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So you're delivered. You're healed from grief. You have pushback. You have the ability to say, no, I resist you, Satan. You take your grief and you leave because I have peace, and I go to sleep at night, and I wake up in peace, and it's not going to come over me in any kind of a depression, any kind of a blanket of of sorrow or hopelessness no i have hope that's part okay lord it all ties in thank you but that's part of living by faith it's not only a way of life but it's your life that's in the word of god and by you putting your faith in the word in the very presence of god with you it causes you to live therefore your body your mind will and emotions your soul all prospers because of your faith. So if you could look at it, from the core of you, from the very core of you, is where life is contained, in your spirit. And it comes out into your mind, your will and your emotions, and it comes out in your body. Your body lives by faith. Now, we know the Bible says this outward man perishes day by day, but our inward man is renewed. That faith, the, the faith man in you, the spirit in you, grow stronger and stronger 
every day until you're present with the Lord. Now, your outward man won't show that necessarily, but it's the truth because you can't see your spirit. You see the outward part of the, of the, of the person. But the inward man, it doesn't get feeble. The inward man, it doesn't falter. The inward man doesn't turn gray. The inward man's getting stronger and stronger, even though the outward may appear to be aging. If, I would, if you allow me to back up here into Galatians chapter 2, and I can read two verses out of here. For through the, let's see, this would be chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. For through the, for through the law, for I, sorry, I see, that doesn't make any sense. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. Okay, now here's a choice. You see, you can live through the law or through the natural, through the flesh, through the normal way things go, through the natural, or you can die to that and you can live unto God. Verse 20, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You live by faith. Faith causes you to live. One more verse, and real quick, I'm going to flip over here to John. In John chapter 6 and verse uh, 63, I think. Jesus has just got done explaining that he is the bread of life and that you need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And a lot of people got offended over that and they're like, what is he talking about? Of course, they're thinking in the natural, right? Jesus is trying to get them to think in the spiritual. But he didn't exactly say that. He said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And if you don't do that, then you're not going to make it. And they're like, this guy's crazy. And, he, he, and, and a lot, it says a lot of people left. I'm, I'm paraphrasing this just to kind of speed it up because I, I want to be quick about this. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Ah. Jesus says, Jesus then, uh, verse 61, when Jesus knew, let's see, this would be uh, John 6, 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured about this. So he's already offended the crowd he was talking to. Now he's looking at his disciples. His disciples murmured about this. He said to them, does this offend you? Like, like also? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. He used the word nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. So that's the words written in red. That's the part I want you to catch. The words Jesus speaks are spirit and they are life. And that's why we need to have faith in them. That's why I say, by your faith you live. We live by faith. So I think I've beat on that enough. I think you got the idea. The, but I wanted to encourage you that, that, that your, your core, your spirit man, is really where your life flows from. Keep that strong. Keep that built up. Keep that protected. That's the part you're guarding when grief comes. That's the part you're guarding when, when, when sorrow comes, when depression comes. Your faith is, is implicit to, to your life. Guard that. Nurture it. Build it up. And I, I, the, the words from the first song that we sang this morning just stuck in me. And, and that was going down the same. But it was, it was, I guess it was, maybe it was, maybe it was the second song then. It was the, it was the Jewish feeling song. Sorry. It was the Jewish feeling song that said, look at the person that doesn't know what to do and tell them, be strong and listen to his voice. And I thought, man, that's exactly what I got on my heart today. So. Turn to your neighbor say, I'm redeemed from poverty. Uh, as I studied on this subject this week, uh, I came across this in my studies, and I just want to share this with you in the beginning. This is really not part of the message as such, but it's, it's some interesting things to think about in regard to who we are as Americans. How many believe that we live in the most prosperous nation of the world? Amen. Uh, the word poverty, except it, it the definition of poverty is not being able to have food, clothing, or shelter. That's what poverty is. Not being able to have food, clothing, or shelter. Well, I can look at you and tell the food area is doing pretty good. 
and I could look at you and tell you dress pretty good. And I think most everybody here has got a place to, uh, to sleep, got a dwelling place. So you are not poor by any definition of the word. Yeah, and we're going to look at that. So this was, uh, this was on a website, and I just wanted to read this a little bit to you. It said, if the population of the earth was reduced to that of a small town with 100 people, it would look like this. 57 of the people would be Asian. 21 of the people would be Europeans. And 14 of the people would be Northern and Southern Americans. And 8 of the people would be Africans. 52 would be women. And 48 would be men. And all the men said, Oh, me. <laughs> and all the women said, Oh, well. <laughs> This next statistic is pretty, pretty uh, eye-opening. Seventy of the hundred people would have colored skin. Only thirty people would be white. Eighty-nine of the people would be heterosexual, and eleven would be homosexual. Six people of this hundred would own fifty-nine percent of the whole world's wealth. And all of them would be from the United States of America. Eighty would have bad living conditions. Eighty of a hundred would have bad living conditions. Seventy of the hundred would be uneducated. Fifty would be underfed. One would die. Two would be born. One would have a computer of the hundred. One, only one, would have higher education. Mm. Only one of the hundred. This morning, if you woke up healthy, then you're happier than the one million people that will not survive next week. If you never suffered in war, the loneliness of the jail cell, the agony of torture or hunger, you're happier than 500 million people in the world. If you can enter into a church without fear of jail or death, you're happier than 3 million people in the world. If, there's a food, if there is food in the refrigerator, you have shoes and clothes, you have bed and a roof, you are richer than 75% of the people in the world. If there's food in your refrigerator, shoes and clothes, bed and a roof, you're richer than 75% of the people in the world. If you have a bank account, money in your wallet, and some coins in a money box, you belong to the 8% of the people in the world who are well-to-do. If you can hear this, you don't belong to the 200 million people in the world that cannot read. Somebody once said, work as if you don't need money. Love as if you've never been hurt. Dance as if nobody can see you. Sing as if no one can hear you. And live as if the earth was a heaven. Does that bring us a little perspective about life? I hope it does. No whining. That's right. Redemption. What is redemption? Redemption is deliverance by payment of a price. In the New Testament, redemption refers to salvation's provision which buys back what has been lost. And the price or the cost was the precious blood of Jesus. I shared an illustration last week about the little boy that bought a puppy with his own money. The puppy got out of the yard, ran away, and was picked up by the local dog catcher. And the little boy went to the pound and bought back his puppy. As he was leaving, he said, I bought you when you were a puppy, and now I have bought you out of the pound. You are my dog two times over. 
Well, we are God's creation. And due to Adam's sin, our relationship with God was broken. When Jesus died for our sins and we received his sacrifice, we were brought back into a relationship or a covenant with God. Therefore, we are God's property twice over. First by creation and later by regeneration or the new birth. Isaiah 42, 22 in the NIV says, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am the redeemed of the Lord. I think of Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh that walked around with a rain cloud over him. A lot of Christians today walk around with a cloud of condemnation, shame, and guilt over their past sins. However, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Let the sun shine down in you. Let the sun shine down in you. Jesus, the Redeemer, the light of the world. Amen. So today as we look at our redemption from the curse of the law given in Deuteronomy 28, we're going to turn to Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us. Say, I have been redeemed. So many times in Christianity I find people putting off things to the future. Well, you know, when we all get to heaven, everything's going to be all right. Well, yeah, everything's going to be all right when we get to heaven. But Jesus came that some things could be made all right now. Yeah, right. Amen. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham, everybody say the blessing of Abraham, might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we may, might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I found in my walk with Christ, and especially in pastoring a church and dealing with people, I found that most people, their Christianity involves getting their lives in a place where they know they'll go to heaven. And they don't move past that. Thank God heaven is our home. Thank God the people we mentioned today have gone to heaven. And if Jesus tarries, we'll all go there one day. All right? But Jesus said, I've come that you might have and have it more abundantly. Running over is what it says. So I found that a lot of Christians don't move on past their understanding of salvation in regard to heaven. And that God wants you to do well now. Amen? Any of us that have had children want our children to do better than we've done. They want our, we want our children to have a better education than we had. You know, my father or my mother didn't have a very good education. So they wanted to make sure I got a good education. And because of their desire for that to happen, I was the first person in our entire family on both sides that ever finished high school. I had one cousin that was ahead of me and he quit his senior year. He would have had that honor. So God wants you as his children to succeed in life. Not just when you get over there, because we'll all be successful over there. But he wants you to succeed in life now. And as Todd's been teaching us, it's about your faith. The just shall live by his faith. Amen. Now, where does Abraham fit into all this? Well, as we look back in the Old Testament, we see that Abraham was the man that cut a covenant with God. That he and God came together as covenant brothers. There was a shedding of blood. And they became in right relationship with one another. Father Abraham had many sons. And we're one of those. Amen. We're a child of God and Abraham is our spiritual father. So the blessings that took place in Abraham's life apply to us today. Now it says in verse 29 of Galatians 3, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We could say according to the covenant. What you have here is your covenant. 
If you would go out to tomorrow and go to a lawyer's office and you would buy a house, they would give you uh, a title to that house. And in that, it would tell you what all was yours. If you lived in a sub subdivision, it would give you the covenants of the subdivision. I don't know if any of you look at uh, any of the property sites, but if you buy property at Massanutten, what is one thing you're going to pay on a monthly basis? HOA, HOA which is a homeowner association fee that you're going to pay. So over and above whatever your house costs, you're going to pay that for the rest of your life because of the covenants they have as part of that subdivision. Okay. So God has a covenant with us and he gave it to us. Now we have a new covenant. Now the old covenant wasn't bad, but it says we have a new and better covenant. So as we look at the old covenant and the things that God did for Abraham, we can have a knowledge and a surety that whatever God did for him, he'll do for us. Amen. Back to the curse a minute. The curse was threefold, poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. And the curse came upon the Israelites because of disobedience to God's commands. As long as they walked with God and they obeyed God, everything was great. But when they got into disobedience... Then the curse, listed in Deuteronomy 28, came upon them and overtook them in all areas of life. God gave them how many commandments? Ten commandments. And then Jews, being like they are, came up with a lot more. But Jesus came to earth. And when Jesus came to earth, he taught that God was, was he love or judgment? God was love, and he broke the Ten Commandments down into two commandments, and those two commandments are love God. love God and love people. Isn't it great when you get up in the morning, you don't have to think, now what were those ten? What were those ten commandments that God gave me? I want to make sure I don't disobey God today. What were those ten commandments? Let's see. Well, I got six of them. What were the other four? No, all you got to do when you get up in the morning is go, I need to love God today, and I need to. Love people today. Now, it takes God's grace in your life to do that. Because some people aren't very lovely. Some people you work with aren't very lovely. Some people you deal with in business aren't very lovely. Some people you maybe live in the neighborhood aren't very lovely. But you are given a command to love people. Amen. Well, what if I don't feel like it? You are given a command to love people. What if they bad to me? You are given a command to love people. And you're commanded to love them unconditionally. How many saw Billy Graham's funeral? Anybody? It was on video the other night. I got to see it on Day, Daystar. Is that the program? And one of the daughters got up that was the prodigal daughter. She's the one that got into a bad marriage and she's the one that got into another bad marriage and she's the one that called daddy one day and said, I need to come home and talk to you and mom. And she was an older woman then, but she made a big mistake. And she said, my daddy lives on the side of a mountain and you got all these curves to go up to get to his house. And said, I was going around those curves going to his house. And I was thinking in my mind, what's daddy going to say? What's, what's daddy going to do when I get there? And said, I got there and I got out of the car and he was standing there waiting on me. And he came up and he put his arms around me. And he said, welcome home. And said, my daddy loved me unconditionally. And that's the way we're to love people out there is unconditionally. Well, won't they just run over you? Well, just get back up if they do. Amen. Amen. But love will never fail you. When they see that you've got that kind of love, you'll get their attention. Amen. So disobedience brought the curse on the Israelites and disobedience will bring the curse on you. That's good preaching, pastor. <laughs> but it's a simple thing. Love God and love people and you avoid the curse. Should I say that again? Love God and love people and you avoid the curse. Amen. Now, if you're not sure you want to avoid the curse, then go back and read Deuteronomy 28, and after you get done, you'll go, yeah, I don't want any of that. It's bad stuff, okay? Philip, in his letter to the church at Philippi, said, but my God shall supply 
all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All your need, spirit, soul, and body. There's provision in this covenant for everything that you need in life. God didn't leave anything out. And there is a promise in this book for every problem that you have in life. You just got to get in the book and find it. Amen? I remember somebody came to me one day and said, I had brother, heard Brother Copeland's message the other day, and then that he was talking about the evils of Dr. Pepper. And back then I worked at Merck, and I drank Dr. Pepper for breakfast, and Dr. Pepper for break, and Dr. Pepper for lunch, and Dr. Pepper for the last break, and Dr. Pepper when I got home, and Dr. Pepper at my meal, and probably one or two before I went to bed. I kid you not, I was a Dr. Pepper holic. So, when that person said, so you need to listen to that CD and, and, and get help. And I said, I don't want to listen to that. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the way a lot of people are. They just don't want to get in the Word. They don't want to find out what might be required of them in regard to these promises being effective in their life. You can hear an amen on me. Or, I wish I hadn't said that, Pastor. All right. <laughs> But my gosh, Paul, you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the things are material things it's talking about. So many people aren't prospering in life because they got their priorities out of order. They're seeking their kingdom instead of God's kingdom. I knew I'd get quiet on that one. <laughs> seeking first the kingdom of God is an attitude of your heart. God's not called all of us to go into full-time ministry. He's not called all of us to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But we are all ministers, right? But He's called you to seek first His kingdom. And so many people are seeking their kingdom. And what do I mean by that? Well, they, they want to buy their house, and they want to buy their cars, and they want to buy their stuff. And after they get all that taken care of, then maybe they'll look to God in the church. So they got their house out of order. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And again, it's a hard attitude. So God doesn't mind you having a house and a car and things, but He doesn't want the things to have you. Little three year old sitting in the nursery playing with his little toy. Another three year old comes up to take that away from him. And what does he say? My. That's mine. So if you have an attitude about your stuff that that's mine and I earned it and you can't have it, then you've got your priorities messed up. Now, I'm not telling you to go out here and give away all your stuff. But I'm telling you, you should be open in your heart to whatever God tells you to do with that. Because if we really understand redemption, if we really understand that we were on the path to hell and God interrupted that journey and He brought us to a knowledge of Him and His Son, so we're no longer going that path anymore. We're on the straight and narrow path. And our, our very life has been redeemed by the blood of His Son. Then who am I to say that I can do what I want to do with my life? I want to do with my life what He wants me to do with my life. I want to work where He wants me to work. Amen. Amen. All right. Luke 6, 38, we find a principle for giving. Give and it shall be given to you. Don't give and it won't be given to you. We could say it that way. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I get amazed at people sometimes that don't want to give anything, but they want God to bless them, bless them, bless them. But it doesn't work that way. Give and it shall be given unto you. Give of your money. Give of your time. Give of your talent. Time. What do you mean give of my time? <laughs> Pastor, I don't have enough time as it is. How am I going to give of my time? Well, let me give you a little insight into that. If you'll sow time, you'll reap time. Yes. Amen. If you'll give time, God will give you back time. Well, how's that, Pastor? How many have ever lost something in the house? 
and you look and you look and you look and you look and you go out in the car and look and you look under the couch and you just looking and looking and you spend all this time looking and you can't find it and then you know you look some more and then finally you go oh god help me find my keys god i gotta go to work help me and you look right at them and you walked over them 10 times and there they are that's how God saves you time. Amen. You just go before God and say, God, I've lost my keys. Holy Spirit, you're with me all the time. You know where they are. So show me where they are. And then your little mind starts going. <laughs> all right. Shut that thing down a little bit. Just be quiet and just get a little leading. Well, go to such and such. Well, I wouldn't have left them there. You ever said that? Well, I, I wouldn't have left them there. Or I wouldn't have done that. And then you walk over there, and there they are. And you're thinking, hmm, I wonder how they got there. It's like the one movie I was watching, the lady's looking for her keys, looking for her keys, looking for her keys. And her husband says, well, where's the last place you were? Well, last night, you know, I, I was in the refrigerator. and did So he opens the refrigerator, and there's the keys. <laughs> now, what person leaves their keys in the refrigerator? Well, not anybody on a regular basis, except Paul. <laughs> Paul would do that. I am not surprised at all by that. <laughs> but, but normally people wouldn't do that, would they? They wouldn't leave their keys in the, in the refrigerator. But the Holy Ghost knows where things are. Amen. Amen? He's good. All right. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2 says, On the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there will be no collections when I come. So this is about the cycle of giving. I shared with you the other week how somebody came to me and said, Pastor, I got to get back. I got to get back in the right priorities here, and, and here's some money that I, I'm giving. I said, Okay, because you can't expect a harvest without a seed. You can't expect a harvest without a seed. But people do it all the time. People want their needs met, but they don't want to do anything about it in regard to principles of the word. Yes, sir. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I did a little study about tithing, and there's a big controversy about tithing. The church today is split almost down the middle in regard to whether tithing is something that uh, people ought to do or not do. Yeah. Well, you got to find your own conviction about that. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm a believer in tithing. Yeah. And I'm not saying this just because I'm the pastor of the church. <laughs> but I believe in tithing because I believe it's a principle from the Word of God. Amen. I don't care if it's in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look at tithing in regard to the law, we see that Abraham tithed before the law. Right. We see that Jacob tithed before the law. And we see in Hebrews in the New Testament that Jesus, our high priest, sitting in heaven, says he receives tithes from men. Amen. Well, well, <laughs> still going on, isn't it? Okay. So a Barnum survey stated that 12% of born-again Christians tithe. 12%. A born again Christian's tithe. That means 12 of 100 people that call themselves born again Christians tithe. Now, the argument against tithing are the people that say, well, that's an Old Testament law. We're not bound to that anymore as New Testament believers. Then I read some other t statistics that said that really New Testament giving should go beyond the tithe. So those of you that are having a problem with 10%, you ought to be given 20. See how that settles with you. Because this life is about faithfulness. And if you can't be faithful to God with your money, which is your treasure, right? Then how are you going to be faithful to God to anything else? Jesus spoke more about money than he did anything. And when preachers speak about money, they're all like, eh. Only 4% of Americans feel they have more than enough. I was sad to hear that. 
Only 4% of Americans feel like they have more than enough. Well, we serve a God of. We're children of. So we ought to have. But why don't some of us have more than enough? Well, one reason we're not operating the principles. We're not sowing, so we're not reaping. Or we're sowing sparingly, we're reaping sparingly. Or we're limiting our thinking to what we can do. I'm not against education. I'm not against hard work. But you will never obtain in this life through hard work all that God wants you to have. It's going to take your faith. I said it's going to take your faith. And it's going to take you operating the principles of the Word. How many have heard of Dave Ramsey, the money manager? He said, tithing was created for our benefit. It is to teach us how to keep God first in our lives and how to be unselfish people. Unselfish people make better husbands, wives, friends, relatives, employees, and employers. God is trying to teach us how to prosper over time. I thought that was an excellent statement. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this. That's the only place you see God saying, try me in this. Just try me. See if I won't do what I said I'd do. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing, there will not be room enough to receive it. So the blessing is not all just about money. I mean, it's nice to have money. But you can have all the money in the world and be sick. You can have all the money in the world and have estranged relationships. Right? Well, the blessing to me is money, but it's also health. It's also good relationships with people. It's also a good job. It's it just go down, 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 all this stuff. That's what the blessing is. So, as a tither, when I give in an offering then I am operating according to this promise. And God says, try me in this. And I've tried him and I've seen that what he said is true. Yeah, true. Now, all of us that are tithers have had times in our life that we didn't tithe. And I can tell you, as a matter of fact, I've had more money when I tithe than when I didn't tithe. Amen. Because when I didn't tithe, I was in disobedience. And I opened up the door to the devil. And he came to Steal, kill, and destroy. You know, he'll rob you. It's amazing when you're operating God's principles, God's way in regard to tithing and also in regard to giving of how good things happen to you. How favor comes to you. Uh, This week I I had, thank God, I finally had my roof worked on. I don't have a new roof yet, but I had my roof worked on from the wind damage. And, And the guy I met there that day, he and his buddy that were working on it, he was a real friendly fellow. And my wife and I had prayed in advance for favor with these guys because the job they they were doing was on the lower end of the roof, but I had some other issues on the upper side of the roof. So after he did his job that day, he came to me and said, you know, you got some problems on your roof. I said, yes, sir, I know. And they're recommending that I get a new roof. And I'm calling it forth in the name of Jesus, a new roof for my house. They only won $18,000. Hallelujah. It won't bankrupt heaven. So he said, uh, show me inside what's going on in your house. So I took him inside and showed him where some of the problems were that I was having. He said, uh, I want to go back up there and work on some of that. I said, well, God bless you. So he was up there another hour working on some of the issues that I had that weren't what he was sent to do. Everybody say favor of God. And I don't think he was even on the clock then. I think they had already checked out for the day. So There's an instance where the blessing, see, the blessing came into my life. He didn't have to do that. But he took an extra step toward me, and that was because of God's grace and God's favor in my life. I can hardly wait till the next rain. (laughs) And we're believing there will be no drips, you know, in the ceilings anywhere. Because God's awesome. Amen. Amen. It also tells us in the Bible, in Proverbs 3, 9, we had someone call us one day, and they said, Pastor, I, I got a question. And I said, okay. He said, uh, actually, talked to Patty, and said, uh, I'm getting a refund of some money, and I need to know whether I need to pay tithe on that refund. And we said, well, if, 
if it was money that you paid tithe on before you paid whatever you paid for and you got the money back, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't tithe on that. They said, well, it was a grant. It was money given to me. So I'm getting back some of it that wasn't used in the grant. So this scripture came to mind. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So this was increase. This wasn't money earned as such, but this is increase in their life. So yes, they should give from that. 10%, well, that's up to them. But they should give part of it. I don't know how many of you stay up late like we do, but if you're up late at night and you see any of these info commercials that are on TV, and it's how to get successful selling real estate, or how to get successful selling this, or doing this, or whatever, they will tell you in those info commercials that you should give away some of your money you make. Now, they don't give you a principle for that, but we know where it comes from. And they said, you should give away some of the money as you prosper, because for some reason, if you do that, you make more money. See, they don't have a revelation of God and His Word in regard to giving, but they know it works. Amen? Now, it tells us that Abraham's blessing was threefold. He was blessed with riches, he was blessed with health, and he was blessed with spiritual life. And the one we're looking at today is the poverty section. So Genesis 13, 2 says, Abraham was very rich. What would you call our president? Very rich. Very rich. He's a billionaire. What would you call Oprah? Very rich. very rich. What would you call the owner of Amazon? Very rich. Very rich. What about the owner of Google? Very rich. very rich. All right. So compare Abraham to these people that we know in the society we live in today. So when God says Abraham was very rich, in livestock, in silver, and of gold, then he was a billionaire. Now, the Bible tells us back in Galatians that Abraham's blessings are ours. Abraham's blessings are ours. So if Abraham was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold, we should be able to be very rich. The other day on Facebook, they have a picture of Billy Graham's house and Joel Osteen's house. And it wasn't a good picture in regard to things he said. Well, Billy Graham chose to live this way. And Joel Osteen chose to live this way. And I dare say it's Victoria. <laughs> just saying. If you hear that, Joel, I'm just saying. But I have no problem with that. That is their decision. He doesn't take a salary from his church anymore because he makes all his money from his books and CDs and DVDs and his travel and all that, and he doesn't take any salary from his church anymore. So they can't say, he's taking grandma's $10 and buying that mansion out there. Well, he's not. So he can do with his money whatever he wants to do with his money. And I told my wife years ago when... Jimmy Swagger was under all this persecution and PTL was under all this persecution for having, in Jim Baker's case, air conditioning for his dog houses that he had. Well, you don't want the poor little things to suffer, right? You don't want them to suffer. But that's his, you know, I, I told her back then, I said, if these men and women would have not donated their book sales, their record, record sales, CDs, DVDs to their ministry, and would have used that for their personal lives, they would have never had any, anything going on in the world in regard to that. Because the world doesn't mind you spending your money that you make. So they would look at that as earned. But when you take grandma's $10 and you air condition that little doghouse, <laughs> they have a little problem with that. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them for having a problem with that. I don't have a problem with a ministry buying a million dollar airplane or $10 million airplane or whatever to use for their ministry. Amen? Amen. We've got to get our mind renewed to this stuff, don't we? So obedience is the key to receiving Abraham's blessing. Why do I want Abraham's blessing? Why do I want more than enough? So I can be a blessing to others. So I can get the gospel out. So I can support missionaries. So I can do what God wants me to do with my money. But if I am 
poor and I have a poor mentality and I'm out here struggling every day to make ends meet and I'm not operating the principles of the word, then I am not blessed and I'm not going to be a blessing to anybody else. One of the condemnations we've gotten from our church is this message of prosperity. And the very people that condemn us over it are people that want this. They want the handout. And my argument to them was, well, if all of us were like you, how would you get any of your needs met through us? It's got to come from somewhere, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but God's not a counterfeiter, so he's not going to you know, bring it down that way. All right, back in Genesis 1. Now, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country. You know, sometimes you got to change jobs. That's not an easy thing to do is changing jobs. But we've had men and women in this congregation that have changed jobs for the better. For the better. Amen? These boys up here in the, in the sound booth, they're much better off. Uh, we've got people in this congregation that at one time this year were tithing $35 a week. Now they're tithing $50 a week. Increases coming in their lives. Why? Because they're operating the principles. Promotion is coming in their lives. Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Now remember, this is on Abraham, so it's on you. I will bless you. So when God says he'll bless you, I tell you, you blessed. Amen. Amen. If Donald Trump came and knocked on your door and said, I'm going to bless you today, <laughs> you'd be going, just put a bunch of zeros on the end of that one you got there. Yeah, a bunch of zeros. I will bless you and make your name great. I love that part. Billy Graham has a great name in the world. A great name. When they got up and spoke about him at that funeral, it was awesome to hear his children and hear other people of the world talk about what a man he was. And you shall be a blessing. So here's the end of it. You shall be a blessing. Say, I want to be a blessing. He goes on to say, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. Hmm. So who's got your back? God does. So when people want to run over you and want to talk bad about you and want to say things about you and your family, hey, they messing with God, right? And he says, if they curse you, I'm going to curse them. Woo, I don't want to be on the end of that. I don't want to be on the end of God's cursing because he can do it big time. All right. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Say, I'm blessed. Galatians 3, 7 through 9. Therefore know that only those who are of faith, say I'm of faith, are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, which is our group, by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, and you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith, say that's me, are blessed with believing Abraham. So our walk of faith enables us to partake of Abraham's blessings, which are riches, health, and spiritual life. And next week we're going to look at the health part in regard to the blessing. So I want to read you in a, a legion of confession. Say this with me. I am the redeemed of the Lord. I am, the of the Lord. I am redeemed from poverty. I am redeemed from sickness. I am redeemed from death. My inheritance does not depend upon works, but on faith in the promises of God. I am a born-again believer. I belong to Jesus. Therefore, I am Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. Abraham's blessings are mine. Amen. Raise one hand toward heaven and say this with me. I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have, and I can do what God says I can do, because God's grace is sufficient in my life every day. I'm in the right place at the right time, every day, doing the right thing. In Jesus' name, amen.